everybody. Uh, my name is Rick McKinley from Mago Day in Portland, Oregon. And uh, thanks to the four of you from Portland, Oregon. But uh, it's my privilege to, uh, to get to interview Eugene Peterson. Um, and I'm nervous because uh, you've helped shape me in a lot of ways. Um, Remember when you wrote the Bible? You're right. That was awesome. <laughs> All right, that's enough. Let's get on with the interview. In all seriousness, um, you have you have impacted not only me but but hundreds and hundreds of pastors, and your memoir, The Pastor, has just come out, and uh, it, so it's just great to be able to take some time and hear from you. And one of, the, one of the things that we've talked about and that comes through really strong in the, the book is all of life forming us as a pastor, particularly your childhood. Um, can you just help us kind of understand that as pastors? Well, Rick, the, um, I think the thing that I hope to convey in the book is that pastor is not a job description. It really is a life that is shaped in a certain way. But it's shaped, all of us have different childhoods, parents, schools, environments, weather. And so to try to model yourself after somebody else is almost always a mistake. Um, I think being a pastor is the most context-specific vocation there is. And um, I never planned to be a pastor, never thought I'd be a pastor, didn't like pastors. And um, they were always, in the world I grew up in, very tangential to what I would consider real life was. And then there came a time when I did become a pastor. It was kind of a crisis time when I was about 25 years old. And then I started looking back and noticing all the things that were shaping. I would, I'd been a pastor all my life. I just didn't know it. And this book helped, brought some of those memories back, things I'd forgotten about for years. I realized that's, that's formative for me. That's how I became who I am. Yeah. But it is, it is it, your life is, voc is, is vocational, not just your job. So even as a... Even those of us here who perhaps don't look back and see this great Christian heritage, but God sort of intervened in our life, but really all of it is something he's redeeming, and all of it is something he's using to form us into the pastors we are today, men and women. Um, your parents played a pretty significant role in that. Um, do you have a story to, to tell us about the butcher shop or... Uh, listening to your mother preach? Well, yeah, I, <laughs> um, my father was a butcher, and I grew up in the butcher shop helping him. Mostly I just uh, washed the glass in the sh showcases. And, um, but I was there, and my mother would, my dad always wore a white apron, and so my mother made me an apron out of flour sacks. And every year, she'd make me a new apron to accommodate my growth. And I knew the story of Samuel, and um, so every year I'd get my new robe, priestly robe, and um, follow my dad around. And. Um, When I was about seven or eight years old, maybe, no, probably was nine, our, we had a new pastor, and he was um, majoring in Leviticus, and he started preaching sermons on Leviticus. And I thought, I was excited, because I knew all about Leviticus. I mean, I'd, I'd grown up in slaughterhouses, killing calves, and, <laughs> and blood sloshing on the floor, and the innards piled in, getting the hides laid out, and, 
After about three sermons, I realized he knows nothing about Leviticus. <laughs> so I just quit listening. Waited. <laughs> he was probably a vegan. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't go well. I waited for the next pastor. I didn't, I didn't have long to wait. We, we got a new pastor every year or two, so it was easy. As you, uh, as you moved into this calling uh, to pastor, God placed you in the middle of starting a church. You were a church planner. Uh, and through that process, developed a congregation, built a church, and found yourself in the tension of success versus calling or vocation after the building's built and the people have come. Tell us about that tension and where you finally ended up. Well, I knew what I wanted to do as a pastor. I just didn't know how to do it. But I, um, I knew I didn't want to be an entertainer. I grew up in entertainment, on entertainment religion. And, um, and then I became a Presbyterian, and I didn't care much what was going on there either. That was kind of bookkeeping. <laughs> and uh, so I, as I had a new congregation, I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do this right, but I think what I really want to do is I want to make sure these people know about God, and they need to know each other. So... God and Jesus and a holy congregation, a holy God, a holy congregation. And in the process of do, starting that, I thought, I've got to be a, insistently local. This is the place I'm called. A congregation is a local place, and it has to be personal. Uh, I've got to develop relationships with all these people. And, um, but then we had a church to build. We had finances to raise. We, uh, the, the, my denomination was paying my salary for three years, uh, decreasing it a third each year, and, and we had a church sanctuary to build, and we did that. We had a viable congregation, and, um, and it, was, it was glorious. Um, but then, about six months after we had built our sanctuary, uh, attendance started dropping off, and I'd go and visit these people, and I say, I've missed you on Sunday. Is something wrong? I offend you? Um, detect some heresy in my... Of course, that was... Mostly, these were new Christians, so they didn't even know what a heresy was. <laughs> and they say, oh, no. Um, no, you're still my pastor. Uh, this is my church. I love this church. Wasn't that great what we did? Who would have ever thought a bunch of nobodies like us could do something like this? Isn't that just great? I'm so, proud. I'm so glad you asked me to be part of this. But don't expect me in church every Sunday. I, you know, I like to fish and hunt. And so after six months or so, uh, my attendance had dropped about a third. And I went to my supervisor and I said, what do I do? He said, start another building program. <laughs> I said, you've got to be kidding. No, he says, that's all Americans know. You have to have a goal. You have to have something to work at and build and make and see it there. Uh, start another building program. And um, so I, when I went, left his office, I knew I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> but, I, but I didn't know what to do. And so I decided I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to find out how to be a pastor. And about that time, I realized uh, that I had an adrenaline problem. I loved adrenaline. I'd been a competitor all my life. Since I was in diapers, I was a competitor. Athletics were a big thing for me. Academics were a big thing for me. Um, I liked to win. I liked to, I liked to beat people. Um, and I realized I can't, starting another building program would do it. I could just feed the adrenaline addiction. And so I started talking to people, reading books, praying, learning how to take a Sabbath, 
Jan and I spent a lot of time together trying to figure out how to, how to get rid of this uh, adrenaline addiction, which it really was. And um, it took a long time. It took six years. Mm. I detail that in the book and the details that went into that. But uh, about six years later, uh, suddenly I kind of emerged like I'd been in this stormy sea for a long time and didn't know what was happening and just I like, came into a nice safe harbor. And, um, and that's when I started to write. I knew, started to write books for pastors mm. because many of the pastors I knew were either in a funk like I was or we're starting another, another building program. <laughs> and, uh, so I thought I'd try. Which isn't much better. <laughs> right. So during these six years, you are really dealing with God. Right. You're learning to keep Sabbath, silence, solitude, spiritual direction, forming your own soul, forming your own marriage, your own home, and from there. Um, what's the church saying about all this as you do nothing and wait? Oh, I faked it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I made motions that indicated I was doing something. <laughs> but I'll tell you what I did deliberately. I realized I don't know how to be a pastor, but they don't know what a pastor does. <laughs> Which is true. I mean, it really is true. So I decided, how can I expect them to know what a pastor does when I'm in the process of learning it myself? So I started taking my elders and deacons on two retreats a year, overnight, and basically the format was, I would say to them, I'm your pastor, I need to know you, I need to know your workplace, What's, what's going on, what's like, and, um, but you also need to know me. You need to know my workplace. You need to know what I'm doing when you don't see me. Um, and so we'd have those two overnight retreats a year, getting to know each other as workers, as pastors, as doctors, as engineers, as housewives, whatever. And, um, it didn't happen all at once, but I was persistent, and they were faithful in, in being with me. But after about five years, I had a congregation of laity that knew what it meant to be a church and not just have a pastor who told them what to do. So that was the thing that really created the congregation as it, as it matured. And part of that, there was sort of a defining moment in there where you literally resigned uh, in your own discovery of this, of the congregation as a holy thing and not, a, not just a means to an end. Yeah. We don't use people yeah. to accomplish mission, but they are the mission. They are the mission. It's cool. So tell us about resignation. Because <laughs> I do it every Monday, but <laughs> I just send a letter to myself. I was... I was... I was sitting in my living room and Karen, my four-year-old four -year daughter, came up to me and after dinner one night and said, Daddy, read me a story. And I said, Karen, I'd love to, but I can't. Um, I've got a meeting tonight. And she said, this is the 34th night in a row that you've had a meeting. And I thought, wow, what have I done? And the meeting I went to was my session. Walked to the church a quarter of a mile. I walked in, I scrapped the agenda. I said to my elders, I resign. And we've done that, we've built this church, we've done this magnificent job, we have a congregation, but I'm not a pastor. I'm not a pastor. I've already failed now as a father, I'm now failing as a pastor. I'm, I'm, I quit. I'm resigning as of right now. And one of the elders said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to be your pastor. I want to be, have time with you. I want to study, know what's going on so I can preach well. I want to be with you in your lives. I want you to be with me in my life. I don't let you get close to me because I'm too busy. 
So I quit. And because uh, you didn't want to be running a church, a church. So they said, "What do you?" Why don't you do that? I told him what I wanted to do. I said, because I want to run this damn church. <laughs> and then one of them said, why don't you let us run the damn church? <laughs> I said, you don't know how. And she said, Looks like you don't know it too well either. <laughs> All of us have learned how to do what we're doing pretty much on the job. We're willing to be on the job with you. So they did. Two weeks later, Karen didn't ask me to read her a story. I walked up to the church. There was a session meeting. I thought I'd just drop in. Um, and I took a chair kind of outside the circle. and. Um, one of them said, what are you doing here? Um, I said, well, I just wanted to encourage you. I didn't have anything to do, and I just started, I just encourage you. And uh, the elder said, you're not here to encourage us. You don't trust us. And he was right. I didn't. And I said, no, I guess I don't, but I'll try. And I left, and I didn't come back. We'd already made the agreement that if they wanted me to come to a committee meeting or a meeting of any kind, I'd come for 20 minutes and leave. But it was their meeting. And it was not easy. I mean, they'd made stupid decisions sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but I preached some pretty stupid sermons sometimes, too. <laughs> so we were even. But over the period of, I guess, maybe that next 10 years, we had a congregation that was fully, well, I, I exaggerate. Jan, I have a middle initial H, and she says it stands for hyperbole. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> so anyway, there are a lot of things that go into this, but you know, every, it seems to be, none of us are exempt from having to do this, to learn how to be a pastor on the job, and to learn how to trust the people who are with us on the job, and let them be full-time ministers, not just Sunday ministers or going on mission trips. Which means you're giving them not only responsibility, but authority but also you're seeing them differently. They're not people that we do something to or do something with, but it really is this holy community. And as a pastor, you're looking at a congregation as a holy community through a different set of lenses. So what are those lenses? I mean, how do you understand the congregation? Well, maybe first two negatives. I determined I would not look at people as problems to fix. That's a big temptation for, for pastors. And I would not look at them as resources to use. Hmm. Another big problem. Both of those things are depersonalizing. That's not being personal. It's not being relational. I'm in charge. I'm either manipulating them or f figuring things out for them or using them to um, further my agenda which I would never say that. It would be God's agenda, the mission. Right. We spiritualize that. We but, do. Yeah. So you're right. I, I was learning how to treat these people as, with dignity as souls, eternal souls, and not just as um, ways in which I could make a living. So, so as a pastor then, you're, you're coming to do what with them? We're not using them, we're not trying to get them to do anything, we're just, because that's where we're all gonna be, like, awesome. So we're gonna stare at them. Um, but, but the truth is, we're, 
we're, we're, we're, we're paying attention to some things that are significant that are going on in that congregation. Most of the leadership um, models we have given to us in our secular culture has to do with getting something done, um, making money, building something, um, going on a mission of some kind. But um, I think the pastor, I thought a lot about this, but I think a pastor's chief job is not to get something done but to pay attention to what's going on and to be able to name it and to encourage it. Nobody else is going to do that. We live in a totally secularized world where leadership positions almost entirely have to do with getting something done. And you figure out a way to do it. And there are a lot of, and a lot of good things get done. I'm not decrying any of that. But a pastor, it seems to me, has a unique position in the Church of Christ to be on the ground, local, in, the, in this community, paying attention to what's going on, what God is doing, what people don't see themselves. We do it with the exposition of Scripture. We do it with prayer. We do it with listening. Um, it's surprised how, I'm, I'm always a surprised how much people respond to listening. And you don't say anything for 30 minutes and they go away saying, the pastor just told me what I'd just been missing. I hadn't said anything. But there was somebody listening in a different context. We talk too much, you say. Yeah. One of the things that you mentioned that you're concerned about with, with the book is that we would take it and use it as a manual yeah. for how we become pastors. And you're really just simply saying, this is my story. Uh, why is it important that we find our story? Because the pastor of vocation has to do with being available to people to lead them into maturity, lead them, lead them into the life of Christ without mimicking you. Uh, trying to be you, giving them the freedom to do this themselves, their own personalities, their own families, their kids, their marriages, their vocations, their, their jobs. And if this can be, you know what I really wanted to say is being a pastor is really a pretty modest job. We're not very important in the economy of the world. But we're very important in the economy of the kingdom. Somebody has to be set aside to pay attention. And that's what we're doing. So <clears throat> preaching, is, preaching is a big part of it. Worship is a huge part of it. Silence is a big part of it. Uh, just being there is a big part of it. <clears throat> so <clears throat> no models to be a pastor. But everybody has a story. And I, I grew up in a Christian home. You didn't. Um, your past is as useful in making you a pastor as my past is useful in making me a pastor. Um, one of the joys of pastoral work is to help people discover their stories and how their parents' divorces did not destroy their lives but maybe gave them some insight how a drug addiction became a way to find something totally new and fresh, clean, how a failure in business um, suddenly released somebody to um, have a new vocation that uh, he was not miserable in, she was not miserable in. And that's, you know, spiritual formation doesn't really mean <clears throat> getting a bunch of disciplines together and doing them. It means paying attention to your life and seeing how all these things come together through acts of prayer, silence, pilgrimage, whatever. When, uh, as we, as we kind of have to wrap it up, if you could give uh, a caution to us as well as sort of a, a charge. Because one of the things that you've done really well is you have been incredibly courageous uh, 
uh, and it's a courage that has resisted really what a mainstream current has, has been forced through the church. And you've, re- you've resisted that uh, because of an ancient kind of vocation that, that you're called to and you're preserving and you're calling us to, for which we're very grateful. But if you could give us a kind of a, a caution and a charge. Well, I guess the caution is we don't let the culture define our position, our vocation. And I'm thinking mostly about our secular culture, although it infiltrates the church. But, you know, we live in a sea of secularity. It's awfully difficult not to be influenced by it. We are influenced by it. Um, but the thing that I think the, the uh, what was the other word you used? A charge. A charge. <clears throat> um, think deeply, pray deeply, read widely in the literature of pastors. Find people that you can, you, they might be dead 500 years, but find out what they were doing, how they were writing letters. Uh, steep ourselves in, in the community of pastors, the company of pastors. Um, this is a unique vocation, and we can learn from a lot of other people, but we need to pay attention to the people who've done it well. And, um, you know, find novels about pastors. Uh, <clears throat> Gilead uh, by Marilyn Robinson, a great pastor's novel. Uh, Diary of a Country Priest by George Bernano, a great, it's, a, it's fiction, it's a novel. Well, so is Gilead. Um, these are just, they help us to understand the inner workings of the pastoral life. Not a, not a, you know, it's not a glamorous life really is not. And we all of us know that. Um, but um, So that's my charge. Steep yourself in the literature of um, the life of faith and um, don't keep your guard up against all the secular stuff going right. on. You're hopeful? You know I am. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of pessimism in the church um, these days some of it hysterical. Um, But you know, we've been in this position so many times in the last 2,000 years, and 2,000 years before that as a Jewish community. We've never been successful. (laughs) Never. Can you find a good one successful church in the New Testament? And when was ever Israel faithful? You know, little periods of time once in a while, but mostly they were a mess. And yet, all through this, salvation is being worked out with people just like us, people just like in your congregations. No, I'm not pessimistic. I, I'm in touch with a lot of people these days, mostly through letters, telephone calls, um, some of them like this. But um, no, I'm not pessimistic. I know it's hard, but it's, uh, it's also glorious. Thank you for your life. Uh, thanks for giving us the gift of you and uh, for fighting hard to preserve a, a vocation that isn't glamorous but is uh, what is a calling, uh, a high calling that we get to have the privilege to live into. You have helped many of us uh, re- learn to be faithful and figure it out, so we're grateful for you. Would you, uh, would you pray for us? Thank you, Rick. Around? I would. I'd love to. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the privilege of being with these friends in this room who share this wonderful calling, this hard but wonderful calling. Thank you for their devotion, their energy, such energy, and for the glorious prospect of being part of the company of pastors that you have called to be in your church through these years, through these centuries. Help us to be faithful in what we're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. (laughs) Eugene Peterson. Are you done? Thank you.
going to do something. Else. Eugene. Appreciate those words of wisdom, and, and we're not going to let you get off the platform quite yet. <laughs> you know something's coming, doesn't he? Eugene, you have had such an influence on so many of us for good, and uh, I shared with you earlier in my own life how your writings and your wisdom came at just the right time, and uh, someday there'll be thousands of us that will testify to that and to the wisdom that you shared and really the challenge that you bring to the church today, which is a healthy challenge. I need it, and we all need it, and uh, we're so grateful for you. And Catalyst, we want to present you with a special award called the Lifetime Achievement Award for your many years of service and dedication. been doing Catalyst since 2000, we always try to honor a leader, a sage, a mentor who's gone before us. And this year, uh, it's my privilege to present Eugene Peterson with the Catalyst Lifetime Achievement Award, March 3rd, 2011, commemorating a long obedience in the same direction. Thank you. Thank you. 